Hi, and welcome to the lecture on orthopedic injuries. We're almost done with the trauma section of the book. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will understand the anatomy and physiology of the musculoskeletal system. You will have learned the proper assessment for a suspected and obvious injury, and you will have learned general and specific types of musculoskeletal injuries, including fractures, sprains, and dislocations, with associated signs and symptoms, and emergency treatment, including the use of splints, pneumatic anti-shock garments, and traction splints. Regarding the EMS education standard competencies for trauma, the EMT will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. Specific to orthopedic trauma, the EMT will recognize and manage open fractures, closed fractures, dislocations, and amputations. You will also, as an EMT, understand the pathophysiology and be able to assess and manage patients with upper and lower extremity orthopedic trauma, open fractures, closed fractures, dislocations, sprains, and strains, as well as pelvic fractures and amputations and deal with replantation issues. Specific to medicine, you will apply the fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings of an acutely ill patient when we talk about some of the non-traumatic musculoskeletal disorders and you'll understand the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, assessment, and management of patients who have non-traumatic fractures. The musculoskeletal system is an important part of our body. The human body is a well-designed system in which form, upright posture, and movement are provided by the system. The system also protects the vital internal organs of the body. However, bones and muscles are susceptible to external forces that can cause injury. Also at risk are the tendons, joints, and ligaments. Musculoskeletal injuries are among the most common reasons why patients seek medical attention, and complaints related to the musculoskeletal system result in almost 60 million visits to physicians annually in the United States. Musculoskeletal injuries are often easily identified because of the associated pain, swelling, and deformity. And although the musculoskeletal system injuries are rarely fatal, they often result in short or long-term disability. It is important that you do not focus solely on a musculoskeletal injury without first determining that no life-threatening injuries exist. The muscular system includes three types of muscles, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal muscle is also called striated muscle because of its characteristic stripes. It attaches to the bones and usually crosses at least one joint. Skeletal muscle forms the major muscle mass of the body, and it's called voluntary muscle because it is under the direct voluntary control of your brain, and it responds to commands to move specific body parts. Skeletal muscle is the component of the muscular system that is included in the overall musculoskeletal system. Cardiac muscle contributes to the cardiovascular system, and smooth muscle is a component of other body systems, including the digestive and cardiovascular systems. All skeletal muscles are supplied with arteries, veins, and nerves. Blood from the arteries brings oxygen and nutrients to the muscles, and waste products, including carbon dioxide and lactic acid, are carried away in the veins. Skeletal muscle tissue is directly attached to the bone by a tough, rope-like, fibrous structure known as a tendon. Tendons are extensions of the fascia that cover all skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is also called involuntary muscle because it is not under voluntary control of the brain, and it performs much of the automatic work of the body. It is found in the walls of most tubular structures of the body, such as the GI tract and blood vessels, and it contracts and relaxes to control the movement of the contents within these structures. Cardiac muscle is a specially adapted involuntary muscle with its own regulatory system. The skeleton, which gives us our recognizable human form, protects our vital internal organs and allows us to move. It is made up of approximately 206 bones, and the bones also produce blood cells in the bone marrow and serve as a reservoir for important minerals and electrolytes. You can see a picture of our human skeleton here. The skull is a solid vault-like structure that surrounds and protects the brain. The thoracic cage protects the heart, lungs, and great vessels, and the lower ribs protect the liver and spleen. The bony spinal canal encases and protects the spinal cord, and the pectoral or shoulder girdle consists of two scapulae and two clavicles. As you can see here in the picture, the scapula or shoulder blade is a flat triangular bone held to the rib cage by powerful muscles that buffer it against the injury. This is the scapula here. The clavicle or collarbone is a slender S-shaped bone attached by ligaments to the sternum on one end and to, and to the acromion process on the other. The clavicle acts as a strut to keep the shoulder propped up. Because it is slender and very exposed, this bone is vulnerable to injury.
The upper extremity extends from the shoulder to the fingertips and is composed of the arm or the humerus, the elbow and the forearm, the radius and ulna, the wrist, the hand and the fingers. The arm extends from the shoulder to the elbow. The upper extremity joins the shoulder girdle at the glenohumeral joint. The humerus connects with the bones of the forearm to form the hinged elbow joint. The radius and ulna make up the forearm. The radius, the larger of the two forearm bones, lies on the thumb side of the forearm, and the ulna is narrow and is on the little finger side of the forearm. When one is broken, the other is often broken as well. The hand consists of three sets of bones, the wrist bones or the carpals, the hand bones or the metacarpals, and the finger bones or the phalanges. The pelvis supports the body weight and protects the structures within the pelvis, the bladder, rectum, and female reproductive organs. The pelvic girdle is actually three separate bones fused together to form the enomic bone. They are the ischium, the ilium, and the pubis. The lower extremity consists of the bones of the thigh, leg, and foot. You can see them here. The femur or thigh bone is a long powerful bone that connects in the ball and socket joint of the pelvis and, is, and in the hinge joint of the knee. The lower leg consists of two bones, the tibia and the fibula. The tibia or shin bone connects to the patella or kneecap to form the knee joint and runs down the front of the lower leg. The much smaller fibula runs behind and beside the tibia. The foot consists of three classes of bones, ankle bones or tarsals, foot bones or metatarsals, and toe bones called phalanges. The largest of the tarsal bones is the heel bone, called the calcaneus, which is subject to injury when a person jumps from a height and lands on their feet. The bones of the skeleton provide a framework in which muscles and tendons are attached. Bone is a living tissue that contains nerves and receives oxygen and nutrients from the arterial system. When a bone breaks, a patient typically experiences severe pain and bleeding. A joint is formed wherever two bones come into contact. Joints are held together in a tough fibrous structure known as a capsule, which is supported and strengthens in certain key areas by bands of fibrous tissue called ligaments. In moving joints, the ends of bones are covered with a thin layer of cartilage known as art articular cartilage, and joints are bathed and lubricated by synovial or joint fluid. A fracture is a broken bone. More precisely, it is a break in the continuity of the bone, often occurring as a result of an external force. It can occur anywhere on the surface of the bone and in many different types of patterns. There is no difference between a broken bone and a fractured bone. A potential complication of fractures is compartment syndrome, and this is when elevated pressure occurs within a fascial compartment. A dislocation is a disruption of a joint in which the bone ends are no longer in contact. The supporting ligaments are often torn, usually completely allowing the bone ends to separate from each other. A subluxation is similar to a dislocation except the disruption of the joints is not complete. Therefore, it is an incomplete or partial dislocation of a joint. A fracture dislocation is a combination injury at the joint in which the joint is dislocated and there is a fracture of the end of one or more of the bones. A sprain is an injury to ligaments, articular capsule, synovial membrane, and tendons crossing the joint. After the injury, the joint surfaces generally fall back into alignment so the joint is not significantly displaced. Sprains can range from mild to severe, and the most vulnerable joints for sprain are the knees, the shoulders, and the ankles. A strain or muscle pull is a stretching or tearing of the muscle causing pain, swelling, and bruising of the soft tissues in the area. It occurs because of an abnormal contraction, and strains may range from minute separation to complete rupture. Unlike a sprain, no ligament or joint damage typically occurs. An amputation is an injury in which an extremity is completely severed from the body. This injury can potentially damage every aspect of the musculoskeletal system from bone to ligament to muscle. Injuries to bones and joints are often associated with injury to the surrounding soft tissues, especially the adjacent nerves and blood vessels. The entire area is known as the zone of injury and you should not focus on a patient's obvious injury without first completing a rapid scan to check for associated injuries which may be even more serious. Mechanism of injury. Significant force is generally required to cause fractures and dislocations. This includes direct blows, indirect forces, twisting forces, and high energy forces. A direct blow fractures the bone at the point of impact. Indirect forces may cause a fracture or dislocation at a distant point. Twisting forces are a common cause of musculoskeletal injury, especially to the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL in the knee. 
High energy injuries produce severe damage to the skeleton, surrounding soft tissues, and vital internal organs. A patient may have multiple injuries to many body parts, and this can occur in motor automobile crashes, falls from heights, gunshot wounds, and other extreme forces. A significant MOI is not necessary to fracture a bone, and remember, a slight force can easily fracture a bone that is weakened by a tumor or osteoporosis. Fractures are classified as either open or closed. Your first primary priority is to determine whether the overlying skin is damaged. If not, the patient has a closed fracture. With an open fracture, there is an external wound caused either by the same blow that fractured the bone or by the broken bone ends lacerating the skin. You should treat any injury that breaks the skin as a possible open fracture. Fractures are also described by whether the bone is moved from its normal position. A non-displaced fracture, also known as a hairline fracture, is a simple crack in a bone that may be difficult to distinguish from a sprain or simple contusion. X-ray examinations are required and a displaced fracture produces actual deformity or distortion of the limb by shortening, rotating, or angulating it. Medical personnel often use these special terms to describe particular types of fractures. A green stick is an incomplete fracture that passes only partway through the shaft of a bone and it generally occurs in children. Comminuted is a fracture in which the bone is broken into more than two fragments. Pathologic is a fracture of weakened or diseased bone generally produced by minimal force and it's seen in patients who have osteoporosis or cancer. An oblique fracture is a fracture in which the bone is broken at an angle across the bone. Usually this is the result of a sharp angle blow to the bone. A transverse fracture occurs straight across the bone and this is the result of a direct blow or stress fracture caused by prolonged running. A spiral fracture is caused by a twisting force, causing an oblique fracture around the bone and through the bone. This is often the result of child abuse in very young children. An incomplete fracture is a fracture that does not run completely through the bone, very similar to a green stick fracture. You should suspect fractures if one of the more following signs are present. A. Deformity. The limb may appear to be shortened, rotated, or angulated at a point where there is no joint. You always use the opposite limb as a mirror image for comparison. Tenderness. Point tenderness on palpation in the zone of injury is the most reliable indicator of an underlying fracture. Guarding. An inability to use the extremity is the patient's way of immobilizing it to minimize pain. The muscles around the fracture contract in an attempt to prevent any movement of the broken bone. Swelling. Rapid swelling usually indicates bleeding from a fracture and is typically followed by substantial pain. Bruising. Fractures are almost always associated with ecchymosis of the surrounding soft tissues, and bruising may be present after almost any injury and may take hours to develop. Crepitus. A grating or grinding sensation can be felt and sometimes even heard when fractured bone ends rub together. False motion. This is motion at a point in the limb where there is no joint. Exposed fragments. In open fractures, bone ends may protrude through the skin or be visible within the wound. You should never attempt to push the end of a protruding bone back into place. Pain, which is common, and a locked joint. And that is a joint that is locked into position and is difficult and painful to move. Dislocations. Sometimes a dislocated joint will spontaneously reduce or return to its normal position before your assessment. You will be able to confirm the dislocation only by taking a patient history. A dislocation that does not spontaneously reduce is a serious problem, and the commonly dislocated joints are the fingers, the shoulder, the elbow, and the knee. The signs and symptoms of a dislocated joint are similar to those of a fracture, things like a marked deformity, swelling, and pain that is aggravated by any attempt at movement, as well as tenderness on palpation, virtually complete loss of normal joint motion or a locked joint, and numbness or impaired circulation to the limb or digit. A sprain occurs when a joint is twisted or stretched beyond its normal range of motion. As a result, the supporting capsule and ligaments are stretched and torn. A sprain should be considered a partial dislocation or subluxation, and the alignment generally returns to a fairly normal position, although there may be some displacement. Severe deformity does not typically occur with a sprain. The following signs and symptoms often indicate that the patient may have a sprain. Point tenderness, swelling and ecchymosis, pain, instability of the joint, and you will frequently not be able to distinguish a non-displaced fracture from a sprain. Remember, document your MOI.
you can see here how sprain type injuries occur. We'll watch it again. You saw the ro rolling motion. A strain is an injury to a muscle and or a tendon that results from a violent muscle contraction or from excessive stretching. Often there's no deformity present and only minor swelling is noted at the site of the injury. Some patients may complain of increased pain with passive movement of the injured extremity. Compartment syndrome most often occurs when, with a fractured tibia or a forearm of children. It's often overlooked, especially in patients who have an altered LOC. Compartment syndrome typically develops within 6 to 12 hours after the injury and it's usually as a result of excessive bleeding, a severely crushed extremity, or the rapid return of blood to an ischemic limb. This syndrome is characterized by pain that is out of proportion to the injury, pain on passive stretching of muscles within the compartment, pallor, decreased sensation, and decreased power. Amputations can occur as a result of trauma or a surgical intervention. You must control bleeding and treat for shock and be aware of the victim's emotional stress which can lead to psychogenic shock. Complications of orthopedic injuries. Orthopedic injuries can lead to numerous complications, not just those involving the skeletal system, but also systemic changes or illnesses. It is essential that you do not focus all of your attention on the skeletal injury. The likelihood of having a complication is often related to the strength of the force that causes the injury, the injury's location, and the patient's overall health. To prevent contamination following an open fracture, you should brush away any obvious debris on the skin surrounding an open fracture before applying a dressing. Do not enter or probe the open fracture site, and remember long-term disability is one of the most devastating consequences of an orthopedic injury. You can help reduce the risk or duration of long-term disability by preventing further injury, reducing the risk of wound infection, minimizing pain by the use of cold and analgesia, and transporting patients to an appropriate medical facility. Assessing the severity of the injury. The golden period is critical not only for life, but also for preserving limb viability. In an extremity with anything less than complete circulation, prolonged hypoperfusion can cause significant damage. Any suspected open fracture or vascular injury is considered a medical emergency. Remember, most injuries are not critical and you can use the musculoskeletal injury grading system in Table 29-1 to identify critical injuries. All of these tables in your text make great study guides, so please utilize them in review. Our patient assessment process is always the same. You hear me say this every lecture. You perform a scene size up, do a primary assessment, take a history, do a secondary assessment, and always reassess. Always look at the big picture, evaluating the overall complexity of the situation to determine and treat any life threats. You must be able to distinguish mild injuries from severe ones because some severe injuries may compromise neurovascular function, which could be limb threatening. Perform your scene size up. Look at scene safety. Check your information from dispatch because this may give you an indication of the MOI, how many patients were involved, and any first aid procedures that may have been used prior to your arrival. Observe the scene for hazards and threats to the safety of the crew, bystanders, and the patient. Try to identify the forces associated with the mechanism. And remember, standard precautions may be as simple as gloves, but a mask and gown may be necessary. Consider the possibility that there may be hidden bleeding and evaluate the need for additional support such as law enforcement, ALS, or other ambulances. Look at your mechanism. Look for indicators of the mechanism and be alert for both primary and secondary injuries. Primary injuries occur as a result of the mechanism and secondary injuries occur as a result of what happens after the initial injury. Consider how the MOI produced the injuries that you are expecting. Perform your primary assessment. You need to focus on identifying and managing life threats. Form your general impression. Introduce yourself and ask the patient their name. Check for responsiveness using AVPU and ask the patient about the chief complaint. Administer high flow oxygen via a non-rebreather mask to all patients whose level of consciousness is less than alert and oriented. Perform a rapid scan and ask about the mechanism of injury, and if there was significant trauma and multiple body systems are affected, the musculoskeletal injuries may be a lower priority. Scene time should not be wasted on prolonged musculoskeletal assessment and splinting. Manage airway and breathing. Fractures and sprains usually do not create airway and breathing problems, but this does need to be assessed. Evaluate your chief complaint and mechanism, and if you suspect spinal injury, take the appropriate precautions and prepare for stabilization. Oxygen may be given to relieve anxiety and improve perfusion. Evaluate circulation. 
you should focus on determining whether the patient has a pulse, has adequate perfusion, or is bleeding. Hypoperfusion and bleeding problems will most likely be your primary concern. If the skin is pale, cool, or clammy, and capillary refill time is low, treat your patient for shock immediately. Maintain a normal body temperature and improve perfusion with oxygen. If musculoskeletal injuries in the extremities are suspected, they must be at least initially stabilized, if not splinted, prior to moving. Fractures can break through the skin and cause external bleeding, so careful handling of the extremity will minimize this risk. If external bleeding is present, bandage the extremity quickly to control it, and the bandage should be secure enough to control bleeding without restricting circulation distal to the injury, and this does need to be assessed. Monitor the bandage tightness by assessing sensation, movement, and circulation distal to the bandage, and if bleeding cannot be controlled, you should quickly proceed to applying a tourniquet. Make your transport decision. If the patient you are treating has an airway or breathing problem or significant bleeding, provide rapid transport to the hospital for treatment. A patient who has a significant MOI but whose condition appears otherwise stable should also be transported promptly. When a decision for rapid transport is made, you can use a backboard as a splinting device to splint the whole body rather than splinting each extremity individually. Individual splints should be applied in route if ABCs are stable and time permits. Patients who have a simple MOI may be further assessed and their condition stabilized on scene prior to transport if no other problems exist. Handle fractures carefully while preparing your patient for transport. Take a history. Investigate your chief complaint. Get your medical history and be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms and any pertinent negatives. A sample history should be obtained for all trauma patients. You need to ask about how much and in what detail as you explore this history will depend on the seriousness and how the patient's condition is and how quickly you need to transport them. Make an attempt to get the history from family members and others who may have the information. In this setting, OPQ RST may be of limited use in cases of severe injury and is usually too lengthy when matters of airway breathing and circulation, as well as rapid transport, require immediate attention. However, it can be useful if the mechanism is unclear, the patient's condition is stable, or details of the injury are uncertain. Perform a secondary assessment. The secondary assessment is a more detailed, comprehensive exam of the patient that can reveal injuries that may have been missed during primary assessment. If significant trauma has likely affected multiple systems, start with a full body scan to be sure that you have found all the problems and injuries. Begin with the head and work systematically toward the feet, checking the head, chest, abdomen, extremities, and back. The goal is to identify hidden and potentially life-threatening injuries, and you need to assess the musculoskeletal system performing a detailed full body scan and use the DCAP BTLS approach. When lacerations are present in an extremity, an open fracture must be considered bleeding controlled and dressings applied. If your assessment finds no external signs of injury, ask the patient to move each limb carefully, stopping immediately if movement causes pain. Skip this step if the patient reports neck or back pain. When non-significant trauma has occurred and your patient has a simple strain, sprain, dislocation, or fracture, you can take the time to focus your physical exam on the particular injury. Look at DCAP BTLS, evaluate the circulation, motor function, and abnormal sensations distal to the injury, and be sure to assess the entire zone of injury. Any injury or deformity of the bone may be associated with vessel or nerve injury. You must assess neurovascular function every 5 to 10 minutes during the assessment, depending on the patient's condition until he or she is in the hospital. Always recheck the neurovascular function before and after you splint or otherwise manipulate the limb. Examine the injured limb and this should include the six P's of musculoskeletal assessment, pain, paralysis, paresthesias, which is numbness or tingling, pulselessness, pallor, and pressure. To assess neurovascular status, follow the steps in Skill Drill 29-1. Next, it's important to evaluate circulation and sensation in the injured limb. Check the radial pulse or ankle pulse and capillary refill. Then test the patient's ability to feel your light touch on either the tips of the index and little fingers or on the tip of the big toe and top of the foot. All limb injuries should be splinted before a patient is moved to prevent additional pain and injury. Vital signs. 
Determine a baseline set of vital signs, including pulse rate, rhythm, and quality, respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality, blood pressure, skin condition, and pupil size and reaction to light. Trending these vital signs helps you to understand whether your patient's condition is improving or getting worse over time. Reassess. Repeat the primary assessment to ensure your interventions are working as they should. A reassessment should be performed every five minutes for an unstable patient and every 15 for a stable patient. Because trauma patients often have multiple injuries, you must assess their overall condition, stabilize their ABCs, and control any serious bleeding. In a critically injured patient, you should secure the patient to a long backboard to stabilize the spine, pelvis, and extremities and provide prompt transport to a trauma center. In this situation, performance of a secondary assessment is a waste of valuable time. Reassess the patient en route to the emergency department. If the patient has no life-threatening injuries, you may take extra time at the scene to stabilize the patient's overall condition. Remove the patient's clothing to look for open fractures or dislocations, severe deformity, swelling, or ecchymosis. Check the patient's circulation, motor function, and sensation prior to and after splinting. When you have finished assessing the extremity, apply a secure splint, commercial or otherwise, to stabilize the injury prior to transport. A comfortable and secure splint will reduce pain, reduce shock, and minimize com compromised circulation. The main goal in providing care in musculoskeletal injuries is stabilization in the most comfortable position that allows for maintenance of good circulation distal to the injury. Include a description of the problems found during your assessment. Report problems with the ABCs, open fractures, and comprised, compromised circulation that occurred before or after splinting. Document complete descriptions of injuries and the MOIs associated with them, and your careful documentation may protect you from legal action that patients may take later. Emergency medical care. Perform your primary assessment, stabilize your patient's ABCs. If it's needed, perform a rapid scan, or you can focus on a specific injury. Always follow standard precautions and be alert for signs and symptoms of internal bleeding. Follow the steps in Skill Drill 29-2 when caring for patients with musculoskeletal trauma. Splinting. A splint is a flexible or rigid device that is used to protect and maintain the position of an injured extremity. Unless the patient's life is in immediate danger, you should splint all fractures, dislocations, and sprains before you move the patient. Splinting reduces pain and makes it easier to transfer and transport your patient. In addition, it will help you prevent the following. Further damage to muscles, the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and blood vessels from broken bone ends. Laceration of the skin by broken bone ends. One of the primary indications for splinting is to prevent a closed fracture from becoming an open one. Restriction of distal blood flow resulting from pressure of the bone ends on blood vessels. Excessive bleeding of the tissues at the injury site caused by broken bone ends. Increased pain from movement of bone ends. Paralysis of the extremities resulting from a damaged spine. A splint is simply a device to prevent motion of the injured part. It can be made from any material on occasions when you need to improvise. Remove clothing from the area of any suspected fracture or dislocation so that you can inspect the extremity for DCAP BTLS. Note and record the patient's neurovascular status distal to the site of the injury, including pulse, sensation, and movement. Cover all wounds with a dry sterile dressing before splinting, and do not move the patient before splinting an extremity unless there is an immediate danger to the patient or you. In a suspected fracture of the shaft of any bone, be sure to stabilize the joints above and below the fracture site. With injuries in and around the joint, be sure to stabilize the bones above and below the joint. Pad all rigid splints to prevent local pressure and discomfort to the patient, and while applying the splint, you should maintain manual stabilization to minimize movement of the limb and to support the injury site. If fracture of a long bone shaft has resulted in severe deformity, use constant gentle manual traction to align the limb so that it can be splinted. If you encounter resistance to limb alignment, splint the limb in its deformed position. Stabilize all suspected spinal injuries in a neutral inline position on a backboard. If the patient has signs of shock, allow the limb in the normal anatomic position and align the limb in the normal anatomic position and provide transport. When in doubt, splint. 
General principles of an inline traction splint. The application of inline traction is the act of pulling on a body structure in the direction of its normal alignment. It is the most effective way to realign a fracture of the shaft of a long bone so that the limb can be splinted more effectively. When applied correctly, traction stabilizes the bone fragments and improves the overall alignment of the limb. You should not attempt to reduce the fracture or force all of the bone fragments back into alignment. In the field, the goals of inline traction are as follows. To stabilize the fractured fragments to prevent excessive movement, to align the limb sufficiently to allow it to be placed in a splint, to avoid potential neurovascular compromise, remember before you apply a traction splint, be sure to control any external bleeding, and the amount of traction that is required varies but often does not exceed 15 pounds. You should use the least amount of force necessary and grasp the foot or hand at the end of the injured limb firmly. Once you start pulling, you should not stop until the limb is fully splinted. Imagine where the uninjured limb would lie and pull gently along the line of that imaginary limb until the injured limb is the, in approximately that position, as you can see here. Rigid splints are made from firm material. They are rigid um, and non-formable, and they are applied to the sides, front, or back of an injured extremity to prevent motion at the site. It takes two EMTs to apply a rigid splint, and you will follow the steps in Skill Drill 29-3. Fractures to long bones, the major bones of the arms and legs, should be protected and immobilized with a splint. A splint can be either rigid or flexible. Its main purpose is to prevent the motion of the injured limb, which can relate to complications, like muscle damage and tearing of the skin by broken bone ends. Use appropriate body substance isolation precautions prior to beginning patient care. A check of the distal circulation through capillary refill or pulse check must be performed when appropriate and possible. Assessment of motor function and sensation must be performed on all extremities. Assess the injury and prepare for immobilization. Based on the specific injury, gather and prepare the appropriate splinting materials. Make sure enough material is available to perform the entire procedure without stopping. Choose board splints or a commercial made device of appropriate size for the patient and the injury. Gently and without unnecessary movement, place the splint on the injured extremity. Apply and secure the splinting material to the bone below the injury. Apply and secure the splinting material to the bone above the injury. After you complete the application of the initial splinting material, ensure that effective motion restriction has been achieved. Ensure that the injury does not bear distal weight. A check of the distal circulation through capillary refill or pulse check must be performed when appropriate and possible. Assessment of motor function and sensation must be performed on all extremities. Upon identifying a joint injury, ensure that the joint is stabilized manually. Assess the injury and prepare for immobilization. Be sure to use appropriate body substance isolation precautions 
prior to beginning patient care. A check of the distal circulation through the capillary refill or pulse check must be performed when appropriate and possible. Assessment of motor function and sensation must be performed on all extremities. Manipulation of joint injuries can create devastating neurovascular conditions. Based on the specific injury, gather and prepare the appropriate splinting materials. Make sure that enough material is available to perform the entire procedure without stopping. Apply and secure the splinting material to the bone below the injury. Apply and secure the splinting material to the bone above the injury. of the initial splinting materials ensure that effective motion restriction has been achieved and that the injury does not bear distal weight. A check of the distal circulation through capillary refill or pulse check must be performed when appropriate and possible. Assessment of motor function and sensation must be performed on all extremities. There are two situations in which you must splint the limb in the position of deformity. This is when the deformity is severe or when you encounter resistance or extreme pain when applying gentle traction to the fracture of a shaft of a long bone. Most dislocations should be splinted as found, but you should also follow your local protocols. Formable splints. The most commonly used formable or soft splint is the pre-contoured inflatable clear plastic air splint. Always inflate the splint after applying it. The air splint is comfortable, provides uniform contact, and has the added advantage of applying firm pressure to a bleeding wound. Air splints are used to stabilize injuries below the elbow or below the knee. Air splints have some drawbacks, particularly in areas of cold weather. The zipper can stick, clog with dirt, or freeze. Significant changes in the weather affect the pressure of the air in the splint. You must first cover all wounds with a dry sterile dressing, making sure that you use standard precautions. For a splint that has a zipper, follow the steps in skill drill 29-4. If you use an unzippered or partially zippered type of air splint, follow the steps in skill drill 29-5 and 29-6. Sorry, 29-6 for a vacuum splint. Other formable splints include vacuum splints, pillow splints, structural aluminum, malleable or SAM splints, a sling and swath, and pelvic binders for pelvic fractures. Traction splints are used primarily to secure fractures of the shaft of the femur, which are characterized by pain, swelling, and deformity of the mid-thigh. A traction splint should not be used if the patient has an obvious injury of the knee or ankle, joint, foot, or lower leg. Several different types of lower extremity traction splints are commercially available, and these include the hair splint, the Sager, the real splint, and the Kendrick splint. Traction splints are not suitable for use on the upper extremity because the major nerves and blood vessels in the patient's axilla cannot tolerate counter-traction counter forces. Do not use traction splints for any of the following conditions. Injuries of the upper extremity, injuries close to or involving the knee, injuries of the hip, injuries of the pelvis, partial amputations or avulsions with bone separation, and lower leg, foot, or ankle injury. Proper application of a traction splint requires two well-trained EMTs, and to apply a hair splint, follow the steps in skill drill 
The Sager is a lightweight and easy to store splint and it applies a measurable amount of traction. For a Sager splint, you follow the steps in Skill Drill 29.8. appropriate body substance isolation before applying a Sager splint. The second rescuer needs to stabilize the fracture site by placing his hands gently around the patient's thigh. Rescuer 1 checks distal circulation and assesses the patient's distal sensation and motor skills. Rescuer 1 then positions the splint between the patient's legs, resting the splint saddle against the ischial tuberosity. Rescuer 2 applies the bridle strap around the upper thigh of the fractured limb, while Rescuer 1 gently pushes down on the thigh. Then Rescuer 2 holds the lower leg while Rescuer 1 applies the ankle harness between the heel and the ankle. The end of the Sager's inner shaft should rest adjacent to the patient's heel. When the straps are secure, gently lift the patient's leg while your partner grasps the shaft. Gently extend the shaft of the splint until the desired amount of traction is recorded on the traction scale. Secure the leg to the splint to minimize lower and mid-limb movement. Ensure the thigh strap is secure. Reassess distal circulation, sensation, and motor function. Pelvic binders are used to splint the bony pelvis to reduce hemorrhage from bone ends, venous disruption, and pain. Pelvic binders are meant to provide temporary stabilization until definitive stabilization can be achieved. Generally speaking, these binders should be light, made of soft material, and easily applied by one person, and they should allow access to the abdomen, perineum, anus, and groin, for exam. Pneumatic anti-shock garments. If a patient has injuries to the lower extremities or pelvis, you may be able to use PASG as a splinting device. Do not use PASG if any of the following conditions exist. Pregnancy, pulmonary edema, acute heart failure, penetrating chest injuries, groin injuries, and major head injuries. Also, if the transport time is less than 30 minutes. As a general rule, gradually inflate the legs of the PASG before inflating the abdominal portion. Always document all obvious injuries and deformities before you apply the PASG and you will follow the steps in Skill Drill 29.9 to apply PASG. The thing we need to remember is once we apply it, we never remove it in the field. It may be possible to treat a patient with injuries to the lower extremities and or pelvis by using a pneumatic anti-shock garment, or PASG, as a splinting device. However, it's best to verify with local medical control 
whether it should be used on your patient, because the situations under which the device is permissible vary from state to state. Use appropriate body substance isolation precautions prior to beginning patient care. on a long backboard. Ensure that all sharp objects have been removed from the area that will be inflated, which will prevent the pants from becoming damaged and unable to accomplish their purpose. Place the PASG under the patient's legs and carefully work it under the patient's hip. Remember, your patient may have a lower spine injury. Caution should be used to prevent additional injury. Position the top of the garment below the patient's lower rib margin. The midsection should be carefully aligned along the spine. Check the distal circulation through pulse check or capillary refill. Also, assess the distal sensation and motor function. This side. Good. Snugly wrap the leg sections around the patient's legs. Because of the design of the garment, it is easiest to wrap the left leg first and then the right. However, wrapping the right leg first works too. abdominal section. If the patient's abdomen is too large for the abdominal section to fit from pregnancy or obesity, inflation of the garment is contraindicated in most situations. Now attach the foot pump to the tubes on the pants. Close the valve to the abdominal section and verify the valves to both leg sections are open. Using the foot pump, inflate both leg sections and close the leg valve. abdominal section valve and inflate. All three compartments can be inflated at one time if necessary. Stop inflating when the Velcro starts to crackle or the pop-off valve pops. Reassess the distal sensation and motor function. There are some hazards to improper splinting, and these include compression of nerves, tissues, and blood vessels, delay in transport of a patient with a life-threatening injury, reduction of distal circulation, aggravation of the injury, and injury to tissue, nerves, blood vessels, or muscles as a result of excessive movement of the bone or joint. 
Very few, if any, musculoskeletal injuries justify the use of excessive speed during transport. The limb will be stable once a dressing and splint have been applied, and a patient with a pulseless limb must be given a higher priority. If the treatment facility is an hour or more away, a patient with a pulseless limb should be transported by helicopter or immediate ground. Specific musculoskeletal injuries. The clavicle or collarbone is one of the most commonly fractured bones in the body. Fractures of the clavicle occur most often in children when they fall on an outstretched hand. A patient with a fracture of the clavicle will report pain in the shoulder and will usually hold the arm across the front of his or her body. Generally, swelling and point tenderness occur over the clavicle, and because the clavicle is subcutaneous, the skin will occasionally tent over the fracture segment. Fractures of the scapula or shoulder blade occur much less frequently because the bone is well protected by many large muscles. Fractures of the scapula are almost always the result of a forceful direct blow to the back directly over the scapula. Provide supplemental oxygen and prompt transport for patients who are having difficulty breathing. If the associated chest injury is not the fractured scapula itself that pose the greatest threat of a long-term disability. Abrasions, contusions, and significant swelling may occur, and the patient will often limit the use of the arm because of the pain at the fracture site. The joint between the outer end of the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula is called the acromioclavicular joint, or the AC joint. This joint is frequently separated during football or hockey when the player falls on and lands on the point of the shoulder, driving the scapula away from the outer end of the clavicle. This dislocation is often called an AC separation. These fractures can be splinted effectively with a sling and swab. A sling is any bandage or material that helps support the weight of an injured upper extremity, relieving the downward pull of gravity on the injured site. To fully stabilize the shoulder region, a swath, which is a bandage that passes completely around the chest, must be used to bind the arm to the chest wall. And you need to leave the patient's fingers exposed so that you can assess neurovascular function at regular intervals. Shoulder dislocations. The glenohumeral joint or shoulder joint is where the head of the humerus meets the gleno glenoid fossa of the scapula. The glenoid fossa joins with the humeral head to form the glenohumeral joint. In shoulder dislocations, the humeral head most commonly dislocates anteriorly, coming to lie in front of the scapula as a result of forced abduction and external rotation of the arm. Shoulder dislocations are extremely painful and the patient will guard the shoulder and try to protect it by holding the dislocated arm in a fixed position away from the chest wall. The shoulder joint will usually be locked and the shoulder will appear squared off or flattened. Some patients may report numbness in the hand because of either nervous or circulatory compromise and stabilization of the anterior shoulder dislocation is difficult because any attempt to bring the arm in toward the chest wall produces pain. You must splint the joint in whatever position is most comfortable for the patient. Apply a sling to the forearm and wrist to support the weight of the arm and secure the arm in the sling to the pillow and chest with a swath and transport the patient in a seated or semi-seated position. Fractures of the humerus. Fractures of the humerus occur either proximally in the mid-shaft or distally at the elbow. Fractures of the proximal humerus result from falls and are common among elderly people. Fractures of the mid-shaft occur more often in young adults, usually as a result of a violent injury. With any severely angulated fracture, you should consider applying traction to realign the fracture fragments before splinting them. Support the side of the fracture with one hand, and with the other hand, grasp the two humeral condyles just above the elbow. Pull gently in line with the normal axis of the limb, and splint the arm with a sling and swath, supplemented by a padded board splint on the lateral aspect of the arm. Table 29.2 gives you characteristics and treatment of fractures of the humerus, and it talks specifically about proximal, mid-shaft, and distal fractures, as well as the characteristics and how we treat these. And again, this is a great study guide. Fractures and dislocations often occur of the elbow, and the different types of injuries are difficult to distinguish without x-rays. However, they all produce similar limb deformities and require the same emergency care. Fractures of the distal humerus. It's very common in children, and it's also known as a supracondylar or intracondylar fracture. Frequently, the fracture fragments rotate significantly, producing deformity and causing injuries to nearby vessels and nerves, and swelling occurs rapidly and is often severe. Elbow dislocations. This type of injury typically occurs in athletes and rarely in young children. The ulna and radius are most often displaced posteriorly, and the posterior displacement makes the olecranion process of the ulna much more prominent. 
As with a fracture of the distal humerus, there is swelling and significant potential for vessel or nerve injury. Elbow joint sprain. This diagnosis is often mistakenly applied to an occult non-displaced fracture. Fracture of the ulcranion process of the ulna. This fracture can result from direct or indirect forces and is often associated with lacerations and abrasions. The patient will be unable to actively extend the elbow. Fractures of the radial head. This is often missed during diagnosis. This fracture generally occurs as a result of a fall on an outstretched arm or a direct blow to the lateral aspect of the elbow. Attempts to rotate the elbow or wrist cause discomfort. Care for elbow injuries. All elbow injuries are potentially serious and require careful management. You should always assess distal neurovascular function periodically in patients with elbow injuries. If you find strong pulses and good capillary refill, splint the elbow injury in the position in which you found it, adding a wrist sling if this seems helpful. A cold pale hand or a weak or absent pulse and poor capillary refill indicate that the blood vessels have likely been injured. Further care of this patient must be dictated by a physician and you should notify medical control immediately. If the limb is pulseless and significantly deformed at the elbow, apply gentle manual traction in line with the long axis of the limb to decrease the deformity. Provide prompt transport for all patients with impaired distal circulation. Forearm fractures. Fractures of the shaft of the radius and ulna are common in people of all age groups but are most seen are seen most often in children and older adults. Usually both bones break at the same time when the injury is a result of a fall on an outstretched hand. An isolated fracture of the shaft of the ulna may occur as a result of a direct blow. This is known as a nightstick fracture. Fractures of the distal radius, which are especially common in elderly patients with osteoporosis, are often known as Collie's fractures. The term silver fork deformity is used to describe the distinctive appearance of the patient's arm. To stabilize fractures of the forearm and wrist, you can use a padded board, air, vacuum, or pillow splint. If the shaft of the bone has been fractured, be sure to include the elbow joint in the splint. If possible, elevate the injured extremity above the heart to help alleviate swelling. Injuries to the wrist and hand. Injuries of the wrist and hand, ranging from dislocation to sprains, must be confirmed by x-ray exam. Dislocations are usually associated with a fracture, resulting in a fracture dislocation. Another common wrist injury is the isolated, non-displaced fracture of a carpal bone, especially the scaphoid. Any questionable wrist pain or fracture should be splinted and evaluated in the emergency department. Because the fingers and hands are required to function in such intricate ways, any injury that is not treated properly may result in permanent disability as well as deformity. For this reason, all injuries to the hand, including simple lacerations, should be evaluated by a physician. Always take any amputated parts to the hospital with the patient and follow the steps in Skill Drill 2910 to splint the hand and wrist. Pelvis Fractures Pelvic fractures often result from direct compression in the form of a heavy blow that literally crushes the pelvis. The blow may be from a motor vehicle crash, a weapon, a falling object, or a fall from height. Injuries to the pelvis can also be caused by indirect forces. However, not all pelvis fractures result from violent trauma. Fractures of the pelvis may be accompanied by life-threatening loss of blood from the laceration of blood vessels affixed to the pelvis at certain key points. Up to several liters of blood may drain into the pelvic space and the retroperitoneal space which lies between the abdominal cavity and the posterior abdominal wall. The result is significant hypotension, shock, and sometimes death. You must take immediate steps to treat shock even if there is only minimal swelling. Because the pelvis is surrounded by heavy muscle, open fractures of the pelvis are quite uncommon. However, pelvis fracture fragments can lacerate the rectum and vagina, creating an open fracture that is often overlooked. You should suspect a fracture of the pelvis in any patient who has sustained a high-velocity injury and complains of discomfort in the lower back or abdomen. Deformity or swelling may be very difficult to see, and the most reliable sign of a fracture of the pelvis is simple tenderness or instability on firm compression and palpation. Assess for tenderness by taking the following steps. Place the palms of your hands over the lateral aspect of each iliac crest and apply firm but gentle inward pressure on the pelvic ring. With the patient lying supine, place a palm over the anterior aspect of each iliac crest and apply firm downward pressure. Use the palm of your hand to firmly but gently palpate the pubic symphysis. If there has been injury to the bladder or the urethra, the patient will have lower abdominal tenderness and may have evidence of hematuria or blood in the urethral opening. Patients in stable condition can be secured to a long board or a scoop stretcher to stabilize isolated fractures of the pelvis. Here is an example of appropriate assessment of the pelvis.
hip dislocations. The hip is a very stable joint that dislocates only after significant injury. Most dislocations of the hip are posterior and you should suspect a hip dislocation in any patient who has been in an automobile crash and has a contusion, laceration, or obvious fracture in the knee. Posterior dislocation of the hip is frequently complicated by injury to the sciatic nerve which is located directly behind the joint. The sciatic nerve is the most important nerve in the lower extremity. It controls the activity of muscles in the posterior thigh and below the knee and the sensation in most of the leg and foot. When the head of the femur is forced out of the hip socket, it may compress or stretch the sciatic nerve leading to partial or complete paralysis of the nerve. Patients typically lie with the hip joint flexed and the thigh rotated inward toward the midline of the body over the top of the opposite thigh. Hip dislocation is associated with very distinctive signs. The patient will have severe pain in the hip and will strongly resist any attempt of movement of the joint. The lateral and posterior aspects of the hip region will be tender on palpation and occasionally sciatic nerve function will be normal at first and then slowly diminish. As with any other extremity injury, you should make no attempt to reduce the dislocation of the hip in the field. Splint the dislocation in the position of the deformity and place the patient supine on a long backboard. Support the affected limb with pillows and rolled blankets and secure the entire limb to the backboard with long straps and provide prompt transport. Proximal femur fractures. Fractures of the proximal end of the femur are common fractures, especially in older people. The break goes to the neck of the femur, the enterotrochanteric region, or across the proximal shaft. Patients display a very characteristic deformity. They lie with the leg externally rotated and the injured limb is usually shorter than the opposite uninjured limb. Patients typically are unable to walk or move the leg and the hip region is usually tender on palpation and gentle rolling of the leg will cause pain but will not do any further damage. Assess the pelvis for any soft tissue injury and bandage appropriately. Assess pulses and motor and sensory function looking for signs of vascular nerve damage. Splint the lower extremity and transport to the emergency department. The age of the patient and the severity of the injury will dictate how you splint the fracture. All patients with hip fractures may lose significant amounts of blood and you should treat with high flow oxygen and monitor vital signs frequently. Be alert for signs of shock. Femoral shaft fractures. These occur in any part of the shaft from the hip to the femoral condyles just above the knee. Following a fracture, the large muscles of the thigh spasm in an attempt to splint the unstable limb. The muscle spasm often produces significant deformity of the limb and usually the limb also shortens significantly. These fractures may be open and fragments of the bone may protrude through the skin. You should never attempt to push the bones back into the skin and there is often a significant amount of blood loss as much as 500 to 1000 milliliters after a fracture. It is not unusual for patients with fractures of the femur to develop hypovolemic shock. Because of the severity of the deformity this, that occurs with these types of fractures, bone fragments may penetrate or press on important nerves and vessels and produce significant damage. You must carefully and periodically assess the distal neurovascular function in these patients. Cover any wound with a dry sterile dressing and a fracture of the femoral shaft is best stabilized with a traction splint such as the Sager. Injuries of knee ligaments. The knee is very vulnerable to injury, therefore many types of injuries occur in this region. Ligament injuries range from mild sprains to complete dislocation of the joint, and the patella can also dislocate. All of the bony elements of the knee can fracture, and the knee is especially susceptible to ligament injuries which occur when abnormal bending or twisting forces are applied to the joint. When you examine the patient, you will generally find swelling, occasional echomosis, point tenderness at the injury site, and joint effusion. You should splint all suspected knee ligament injuries and the splint should extend from the hip joint to the foot stabilizing the bone above the injured joint and the bone below it. A variety of splints can be used including a padded rigid long leg splint or two padded board splints. Knee dislocation. Dislocations of the knee are true emergencies that may threaten the limb. When the knee is dislocated the ligaments that provide support to it may be damaged or torn. The proximal end of the tibia completely displaces from its juncture with the lower end of the femur, usually producing a significant deformity. Always check the distal circulation carefully before you take any other steps. The direction of dislocation refers to the position of the tibia with respect to the femur. Anterior knee dislocations are the most common, occurring in about half of the cases. In posterior dislocations, a direct blow to the knee forces the tibia to shift posteriorly and medial dislocations result from a direct blow to the lateral part of the leg. Patients will typically complain of pain in the knee and report that the knee gave out.
Complications include limb-threatening popliteal artery disruption, injuries to the nerves, and joint instability. If adequate distal pulses are present, splint the knee in the position in which you found it and transport the patient promptly. Fractures about the knee. Fractures about the knee may occur at the distal end of the femur, at the proximal end of the tibia, or in the patella. It is easily to confuse a non-displaced or minimally displaced fracture about the knee with a ligament injury. Management of the two types of injuries are as follows. If there is an adequate distal pulse and no significant deformity, splint the limb with the knee straight. If there is an adequate pulse and significant deformity, splint the joint in the position of the deformity. If the pulse is absent below the level of injury, suspect possible vascular and nerve damage and contact medical control. And never use a traction splint if you suspect that the patient has a fractured knee. Patellar dislocation. A dislocated patella most commonly occurs in teenagers and young adults who are engaged in athletic activities. Usually, the dislocated patella displaces to the lateral side. The displacement produces a significant deformity in which the knee is held in a moderately flexed position and the patella is displaced to the lateral side of the knee. You should splint the knee in the position in which you found it and most often this is with the knee flexed to a moderate degree. Apply padded board splints to the medial and lateral aspects of the joint extending from the hip to the ankle. Injuries of the tibia and fibula. The tibia or shin bone is the larger of the two leg bones that are responsible for supporting the major weight bearing surface of the knee and ankle. The fibula is the smaller of these two bones. Fracture of the shaft of the tibia or the fibula may occur at any place between the knee joint and the ankle joint. Usually, both bones fracture at the same time. Even a single fracture may result in a severe deformity with significant angulation or rotation and open fractures of the tibia are a quite common occurrence. These fractures should be stabilized with a padded, rigid, long leg splint or an air splint that extends from the foot to the upper thigh. Correct severe deformity before splinting by applying gentle longitudinal traction. These fractures are sometimes associated with vascular injury as a result of distorted position of the limb following injury. Realigning the limb frequently restores an adequate blood supply to the foot and if it does not, transport promptly and notify medical control. Ankle injuries. The ankle is a very commonly injured joint, and these types of injuries occur in people of all ages and range in severity from a simple sprain to severe fracture dislocations. Any ankle injury that produces pain, swelling, localized tenderness, or the inability to bear weight must be evaluated by a physician. The most frequent mechanism of ankle injury is twisting, which stretches or tears the supporting ligaments. You can manage the wide spectrum of injuries to the ankle in the same way as follows. Dress all open wounds, assess distal neurovascular function, correct any gross deformity by applying gentle longitudinal traction to the heel and before releasing traction apply a splint. Foot injuries. Foot injuries can result in the dislocation or fracture of one or more of the tarsals, metatarsals, or phalanges of the toes. Toe fractures are especially common and of the tarsal bones the calcaneus or the heel is the most frequently fractured. Frequently, the force of injury is transmitted up the legs to the spine, producing fracture of the lumbar spine. If you suspect that the foot is dislocated, immediately assess for pulses and motor and sensory function. If pulses are present, immobilize the extremity using a commercially available splint, and if pulses are absent, contact medical control. Injuries of the foot are associated with significant swelling, but rarely with gross deformity. Vascular injuries are not common. Lacerations about the ankle and foot may damage important underlying nerves and tendons, and puncture wounds of the foot are common and co may cause serious infection if not treated early. To splint the foot, apply a rigid padded board splint, an air splint, or a pillow splint stabilizing the ankle joint in the foot. Leave the toes exposed, and when the patient is lying on the stretcher, elevate the foot approximately 6 inches to minimize the swelling. Compartment Syndrome if you have a pediatric patient with a fracture below the elbow or the knee, be on the lookout for these signs and symptoms. Extreme pain, decreased pain sensation, pain on stretching of the affected muscles, and decreased power. These are indicators that the pressure within the fascial compartment is elevated. If you suspect that your patient has compartment syndrome, splint the affected limb and provide immediate transport. Reassess neurovascular status frequently during transport, and remember, this must be managed surgically. Amputations. Surgeons today can occasionally reattach amputated parts. With partial amputations, make sure to immobilize the part with bulky compression dressings and a splint to prevent further injury. Do not sever any partial amputations and control any bleeding to the stump. If bleeding cannot be controlled, you should apply a tourniquet.
With a complete amputation, make sure to wrap the clean part in a sterile dressing and place it in a plastic bag. Put the bag in a cool container filled with ice. The goal is to keep the part cool without allowing it to freeze or develop frostbite. The amputated part should be transported with the patient to the appropriate resource hospital. Sprains and strains. Strains occur and you have to remember that with strains especially there's no deformity present most of the time and there's only minor swelling noted at the site of the injury. The patient may complain of increased sharp pain with passive movement, severe weakness of the muscle, and extreme point tenderness. General treatment is similar to that of fractures and includes the following. Rest, immobilize or splint the injured area, ice or cold pack over the extremity, compression with an elastic bandage, elevation, reduced or protected weight bearing, and pain management as soon as practical. With sprains, these usually result from a sudden twisting of a joint beyond its normal range of motion and that causes a temporary subluxation. The majority of sprains involve the ankle or the knee. And you should err on the side of caution and treat every sprain as if it is a fracture. Sprains are typically characterized by pain, swelling at the joint, and discoloration over the joint. The patient may have an unwillingness to use the limb and point tenderness. They usually do not involve deformity and joint mobility is usually limited by pain, not by joint incongruity. General treatment is the same as that for strains. In summary, skeletal or voluntary muscle attaches to bone and forms the major muscle mass of the body. This muscle contains veins, arteries, and nerves. The human body contains 206 bones, and when this living tissue is fractured, it can produce bleeding and significant pain. A joint is a junction where two bones come into contact. Joints are stabilized in key areas by ligaments. A fracture is a broken bone, a dislocation is a disruption of a joint, and a sprain is a stretching injury to the ligaments around a joint, and a strain is a stretching of the muscle. Depending on the amount of kinetic energy absorbed by tissues, the zone of injury may extend beyond the point of contact. Always maintain a high index of suspicion for associated injuries. Fractures of the bones are classified as open or closed. Both are splinted in a similar manner, but remember, control of bleeding and application of sterile dressings to the open extremity injury before you splint. Fractures and dislocations are often difficult to diagnose without an x-ray exam. You will treat these injuries similarly. Stabilize the injury with a splint and transport the patient. Signs of fractures and dislocations include pain, deformity, point tenderness, false movement, crepitus, swelling, and bruising. Signs of sprain include bruising, swelling, and an unstable joint. Compare the unaffected extremity with the injured extremity for differences whenever possible. There are three main types of splints used by EMTs, rigid splints, traction splints, and formable splints. Remember to splint the injured extremity from the joint above the joint from the joint above to the joint below for complete stabilization. A sling and swath is used commonly to treat shoulder dislocations and to secure injured upper extremities to the body. Lower extremities can be secured to the unaffected limb or to a long backboard. The most common life-threatening musculoskeletal injuries are multiple fractures, open fractures with arterial bleeding, pelvic fractures, bilateral femur fractures, and limb amputations. I appreciate your listening to this lecture, and as always, please bring any questions to your instructor in the face-to-face -face portion of this class, and thank you.